I'll tell you what, we are currently recording, so whenever you guys are ready. These are the little prepared introduction we have. Oh, this is Justin Howard and Matthew Evans, and we are here with Dr. Bruce Alt to interview him as part of the University of Cincinnati History 3097 Honors Seminar, seminar Course titled Bearcats Legacies in collaboration with the University of Cincinnati Am Am Amoretti Faculty History Project. The date is Friday, February 2nd, 2018, and the time is 4 p.m. This interview is taking place at Dr. Alt's office at 401 Crosley Tower. Dr. Alt, thank you for being here today. I'm happy to be here. To begin, um, could you tell us what is your full name and when and where you were born? Okay. <clears throat> full name is Bruce Stafford Alt. I was born at St. Luke's Hospital, which is right on the border of uh, the cities of Altadena and Pasadena in California. And is there a family history to your name, or why were you named Bruce Stafford? Well, um, my parents were married in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, in the middle of World War II, and uh, though the, neither were Scottish, they, because of the war circumstance, they met there, and one of the historic heroes of Scotland is Robert the Bruce, so they took the Bruce from that. Stafford is a family name, and then Alt's my uh, father's name. And you said that your parents were not Scottish. What is their uh, origin? Um, my father's family has been in the United States uh, from before the Revolutionary War. They can trace it back originally to Switzerland in the 1600s. On the other hand, my mother was born and spent her early years in Norway, in a small town, what was then a small town, now a city on the southwest coast, and she emigrated to the United States when she was 20, in 1928. Okay, nice. And what were your, um, your father and your mother's professions? Well, my father was a a uh, journalist, newspaper editor, and uh, book author, and he was uh, a reporter for the United Press International during the World War II years, and in later years he was with Patton in the early years of World War II in North Africa, and then he was reassigned to uh, London for the last two years of the war and was the chief of the London Bureau of the United Press. My mother never had a formal profession. She uh, came to the United States mostly to escape Norway and what was then very difficult living circumstances. And she came as an escort to a younger, wealthy Norwegian girl coming to visit relatives in uh, Connecticut. Once she got here, she simply stayed and worked a variety of odd jobs up and down the East Coast until World War II broke out, the Nazis invaded German, uh, in Norway, and she immediately enrolled in the Norwegian resistance. And she went to Toronto, Canada for training, and she was trained to be a nurse in the Norwegian resistance. She was then assigned to uh, be a nurse in Reykjavik, Iceland, as my father was assigned to Reykjavik as a war correspondent attached to the U.S. Army and they actually ended up on the same boat from Halifax, Nova Scotia over to Reykjavik, and that's where they met and their courtship began. After World War II and they moved back to the United States, she was a housewife and mother for an entire uh, time. She never had a uh, job. So how did your family end up in, in California? You said that you had well. Uh, as I said, my dad was a, a journalist and newspaper editor, and there were a group of them who were stationed uh, in London during the war at the United Press International Office, and they talked about what they were going to do after the war ended. And looking for opportunities, they decided right shortly after the war ended to uh, start a new newspaper in that burgeoning area known as Los Angeles. So they all moved out to LA and my father was the managing editor of the uh, Los Angeles Mirror News, which was an afternoon newspaper competitor to the LA Times. And then, um, so I guess just, you know, moving from there, um, 
how did you know your father being a journalist and um, and that kind of influence your kind of school life or you know your studies growing up? Well, you know, I went through uh, elementary school, high school, the normal way. Um, you know, the, but I always had an interest in science. Both of me, though my dad was a journalist, he was very good with numbers, and my mom was had an intrinsic curiosity, although her education was rudimentary. I don't think she ever finished high school, uh, but she was very bright and very much interested in everything, and that led me to an interest in science. So I think science was sort of my specialty going through high school, uh, but with the good fortune that my father, being a journalist and author, was an excellent writer, and he um, worked hard to instill writing skills in me. Uh, and those over the years here at UC have proven to be very valuable, because writing is something we sometimes forget that scientists do, but they absolutely need to, and I had that sort of the background. But from there and uh, in high school, I chose to go to Caltech, which is a very much a science and engineering school for my undergraduate education. And was, you know, growing up, was college in, in expectation that you would attend? There was absolutely no question. We were going to college, <laughs> yes. Did your, uh, I know you mentioned that your mother um, most likely didn't finish high school. Did your father um, go to college? And yes, he um, went to DePaul University in Indiana. Okay where he got his degrees in English and journalism, uh, and then started in the practice of journalism. So once you were at Caltech, what made you decide to, say, pursue your career and keep going and get a PhD? Well, uh, like many students, um, I bounced around with, with a few different majors at Caltech while I was there. I started out in math and realized pretty quickly that wasn't going to work, uh, so I switched uh, ultimately to chemistry and you know I think I would was no, by no means a stellar student there among the group of students at Caltech <clears throat> but in my senior year I got into undergraduate research and I got involved with the research project with one chemistry professor and that really got me thinking about research as a career and in the sciences to be a, a research uh, chemist really means a PhD. Mm -hmm. And then with your kind of collegiate career, undergraduate, graduate, and, um, and postdoctorate, how were you supported by, you know, as a student? You know, any mentors or you know, how were you helped along your Well, journey? when in graduate school, um, you work with a faculty member very closely. And although I sure didn't know a lot about what I was doing when I got to graduate school, and there was a group of us who came in in the fall of 70 at the same time, there was a big scramble to find a research mentor and a research group to, uh, for your graduate studies. And it happened over just a couple day period and to be honest I was very, very fortunate to land in a group of, uh, run by George Pimentel and he turned out to be an excellent mentor both in research and in uh, how to be a professional scientist. So he really helped me along the way. <clears throat> but although I learned to do research there, uh, it's certainly true that I was not prepared to go out and lead someone else doing research by the time I got my PhD. And that's really, in science is what a postdoc is for. So I got a postdoctoral position at the University of Virginia, had a very, very different mentor there, uh, Lester Andrews, uh, who had totally different style than Pimentel, and I had to make the switch gears quickly, but it taught me the different ways to look at how to uh, lead a research group, how to mentor, as well as get more seasoning in terms of doing research. So the two of them, George Pimentel and then Lester Andrews, were invaluable in you know, getting my career started. What were some of your early research interests? Well. Um, Within chemistry, there's a whole range of, of opportunities and possibilities. Um, my interest started out very quickly and stayed with 
sort of the interface of chemistry and physics, which is, say, physical chemistry. It is more about measuring and understanding the properties of molecules and how molecules react, whereas an organic chemist, for example, would be interested in making new molecules. So in chemistry, there's sort of people who make molecules and people who study and analyze molecules. And I was much more on the study and analyze side, uh, and that just fit my, uh, I think, my mental, you know, indicate, you know, predilections. And how did you end up at UC after your postdoctoral? Studies? Well, um, this was in the mid 1970s. Uh, there had been a big boom in university hiring in the 60s, especially in the sciences, which I would I think is attributed to. Uh, the Russians launching Sputnik in, in the late 50s, and then the U.S. trying to catch up in, in science and engineering. And that, so there was a big growth in the 60s, and then as we got into the 70s, and uh, all that hiring pretty much stopped. So it was not many job openings and a lot of competition. So I was on, really on the job market two years. I had a number of interviews around the country, maybe five or six each year. I had one job offer, which for better or worse, I turned down, and then, because it didn't feel like the right fit, and then I think the last in job interview I had was in the spring of 1976 here at UC, and I told my wife as soon as I left, this was the place. It just felt right, and apparently they thought so also, because they you know, within a couple of weeks I had a job offer here. So it was really market driven. Uh, a PhD to me is a, what I would call a national degree. You can't necessarily dictate where you're going to end up. Uh, and you just follow where the jobs are, where you might get an offer. And here it was Cincinnati. And uh, when you were hired at UC, what were you, what, were, what was your initial role? You know, what classes were you teaching? Um, that. It was interesting. I my first assignment uh, as a brand new faculty member in the fall of 1976 was a class of 600 freshmen in you know, general chemistry in Zimmer Auditorium, and if that's not enough to scare anybody. Uh, however, I had a senior colleague in the office next to me who said, "This is nuts." And he said, no, we're not going to let you do that. And he took the course over for me. So instead, I ended up teaching a much smaller junior level uh, physical chemistry course that fall, uh, first semester. The only thing I hadn't planned on, the first day of classes, we were living out uh, in an apartment out on you know, the west side and because we didn't want to buy a house right away. And I've been coming in to work every day, getting the lab started and getting organized and so forth. And then the first day of class, I drove into campus and could not find a single place to park anywhere. And it was about an hour before class and I kept circling and looking and uh, panicking that I wasn't going to, I finally parked some distance away and had to sprint uh, to campus and just got to the class at the minute it was supposed to start. <laughs> And what have been, um, you know, moving forward in your time at UC, what are some other classes that you've, you know, progressed into maybe a year? Well, um, in the early years, I did teach quite a bit of freshman chemistry, which I actually enjoy doing. Um, I think it's a place where you can have a lot of impact on a lot of students because the classes are large. But if you do it well, you can really, I think, have an impact and, uh, provide a positive image and feeling about uh, science. So I taught a fair bit of freshman chemistry uh, and the rest were primarily uh, junior level physical chemistry and occasionally uh, an advanced graduate course in, in my specialty. Okay. And you know, since you've been here, what have, uh, what have been some research assignments or some papers or theories that have been some of your more notable work or something. Well, you know, that's you know, you know, that's in the eye of the beholder for sure. And in fact, if one doesn't get research assignments. You come up with your own research ideas. You uh, promote them first to graduate students who will generally be the ones working on it, 
and secondly, to the funding agencies to try to raise money to pay for the research, because research in chemistry and the sciences is expensive, and bringing in grant dollars to pay for that research is something that we are expected to do. So I've had a number of interests over the years in that arena. I think the early years sort of built on my training, in both in Virginia and at Berkeley, uh, some work on hydrogen bonding and some other, you know, carryovers. And then uh, in later years, I got more interested in uh, things like the role of ozone in the atmosphere and the, you know, some of the atmospheric chemistry that people proposed was going on but hadn't been able to observe. All of this from the fall of 1970 and the start of graduate school through today revolves around a single you know, primary technique, something known as matrix isolation. And that combined with infrared spectroscopy as a detection uh, technique really have driven the work that we're doing. And that technique uh, involves trapping very reactive molecules at nearly absolute zero, and then using uh, spectroscopy to characterize and understand the molecules that would never exist for any length of time at room temperature. And how has technology over the last you know, 40 years changed how uh, research is done? Hugely. Uh, there is no question at all about that. Um, the infrared spectrometer that we use back then, the, the, these were old uh, tube instruments and you had to know tube electronics to try and keep them working. Uh, the ones that was here when I came here was an old instrument that I, you know, was given to me as a hand-me-down and I had to keep going and it was uh, what's known as a dispersive spectrometer so we had to shine light off of a grating and get a diffraction and then send that and since about the early 1980s they developed what are known as Fourier transform infrared spectrometers that are much faster, much more sensitive, allow signal averaging and digital storage. So if we went out to my lab, you would see that from the early years there, there's probably a pile about five feet high of uh, spectra from an old chart recorder off those first instruments. Uh, and since we went to everything digital, uh, those have just sat there and, and, you know, really haven't been used again at all because we published what we could from that. So um, that's one aspect that has changed and made life ever so much easier. The other aspect uh, of technology and really a combination of technology and the advance of science is that uh, Quantum mechanics, which came along in the 1910s, 1920s, has been developed further and further to the point where we can use uh, the methods of quantum mechanics to calculate the structures and the spectra of uh, possible molecules from first principles uh, to compare to our experimental results. And that has been a great tool so the development of the software that allows that, plus the computers to have the speed to be able to uh, solve what are incredibly complex mathematical problems, uh, which I just set up with a few clicks of a mouse. And uh, you know, in the 80s, it was you know you could do it very slowly because PCs hadn't had very little memory and very little speed. And nowadays, I'm running some right now on my laptop. And for the more complex jobs, we, uh, you know, send them remotely up to the Ohio supercomputer for the computational work. So that, that has made a huge, huge difference in how we think about what we do and what we're able to do. Yeah. Wow. And I guess moving, you know, away from research more into the classroom environment, how has that changed in the last, um, you know, few decades? Well, uh, multiple ways. <coughs> um, I think number one, of course, is technology. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do now that we never used to be able to do with, with chalk on a, a marker on a chalkboard. 
uh, especially with my handwriting, when we were limited. And now, uh, as we've evolved first off into uh, slides that we could put up or overhead uh, projection, and now to PowerPoint uh, and embedded videos and everything else, the technology has opened the doors for us to do a lot more, to be a lot more visual with the work that we do. I think that's one aspect, but the other aspect is how we think about how we teach. And as, as was sort of described to me in the late 90s, the model for hundreds of years had been what's known as the sage on the stage. We stand up there, we lecture, we spew information, and we hope the students somehow catch some fraction of it. And now the thinking is much more what they call the guide by the side, which is to say interactive student participation, uh, uh, much less lecturing, more small group work, interactive work, things of this sort. So philosophically, there's been a change, which is for an old timer is hard to do in its way, because we're so trained to lecture and to uh, talk at the students rather than to engage them and get them talk, you know, interacting and talking back to us. So both technologically and philosophically things have changed. And then in some ways curricular has, you know, ideas have changed as well. It used to be that we taught our, particularly our majors, the five subdisciplines of chemistry. You took courses in analytical, you took courses in PCHEM, in biochem, organic, inorganic, uh, and that was sort of a lockstep curriculum. We've made several changes over the years in that, and we now teach two one-credit courses that are required that teach how to be a professional, how to uh, develop professional skills, soft skills that need to go out into the workforce besides having the core knowledge of chemistry. So we spend a lot of time with our students teaching these things as well as uh, the chemistry itself. And the other aspect is the role that undergraduate research plays in the curriculum. Uh, when I started out it was something that, well yeah, you could do that, and a few undergraduates did it, but it wasn't really a point of emphasis. Uh, our emphasis in that increased in the early 2000s, and when we switched to semesters, what now, six years ago, uh, we decided to make undergraduate research mandatory for everyone majoring in our department. And that's a different skill set, but a type of training that the real world wants out of uh, chemistry majors. Um, so I guess kind of where do you think we should go? After this half, just the next one. Um, do you believe that the students or the faculty and administration have had more to do with like the overall environment of the campus during? Ah, uh, <laughs> that is a loaded question. Um, certainly, uh, the students have a role. <laughs> students have changed. Uh, over my 40 some years here. And that's, you know, that's not a bad thing, but uh, uh, the students of today have grown up differently with different experiences, uh, different skills, different interests, and they expect different things from the faculty. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the students have driven part of the changes that have happened. I think faculty are still very, at least in our department, which I know best, are still very research oriented. We Research is a major expectation of faculty in chemistry, both in terms of productivity, you know, publications, and also of securing grant funds. Uh, but in the early days, research was much more thought about as acquiring basic knowledge and understanding of nature. And now, in more recent years, the focus has been much more on shorter term applied research. What can this do for me in the next few years? Uh, what can we do to patent things, you know, technology transfers? There's much more emphasis on those sorts of applied aspects of research rather than fundamental research, which was what I was trained to do and what I think was going on here more in the early years. 
And then the administration has changed, the tone of the university has changed uh, substantially as well. Um, it was in many ways a fairly quiet city university when I got here. It was still a city at that point in time. And now it's a major national university uh, and one that is much more financially driven, uh, money driven, at least more openly than it had been in the early years. And um, it's not alone by any means. My son and daughter are both in academics and I hear about their universities and what's happening. And it's no different that uh, there's much more emphasis on financial accountability and uh, cost savings and so forth than uh, I recall in the early years. And then, <clears throat> you know, looking at this, how has um, the way that you interact with students changed? You know, he, we talked about the, the research, the classroom, but just overall, you know, interacting with undergraduates or even graduates, how has that changed? Well, um, first off, obviously email, has, it was a game changer for everybody. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because teaching uh, 400 freshmen in general chemistry in 1980 involved going to class, doing what you do, lecturing, holding office hours, period, in terms of student interactions. Mm -hmm. And certainly I always welcomed office hours and I was always frustrated that not many students uh, ever came to office hours uh, when I really felt that would be every, in everyone's best interest. Um, some did repeatedly, but many never did. Nowadays, I know I haven't taught freshman chemistry in some number of years, I hear that you know the people teaching general chemistry get on the order of 100 emails a day from uh, freshmen in their class. And just keeping up with answering those is a major time consideration, and I'm not sure quite how they do it. And then you f uh, throw in other forms of social media, um, certainly Twitter uh, and things like that, and uh, the means of interaction is very different. However, again, being an old timer in, in a mental sense, if nothing else, I believe in what's on the floor over there, which is a welcome mat for my office. And I'd much rather have people, whether it's students, faculty, administrators, come in and talk face to face than to uh, use you know, electronic forms of communication. I think we can say much, much more in person, face to face than uh, but I realize that that isn't the way many students and, uh, and faculty are trained to function these days. Definitely. Um, and then just to kind of bring it back a little bit, you mentioned, you know, in the 60s when um, there was a big emphasis on science, you saw kind of a, uh, an upward trend in terms of the, any science or mathematic field. Right. Have you seen any trends like that in recent time with chemistry or some other <coughs> sciences? Yeah, I would uh, say after that Sputnik uh, boom and then uh, really quite a lull for let's say the 80s uh, and 90s, uh, then as we moved into uh, the 21st century, uh, the emphasis on STEM education got, you know, much, much greater than it had been. More students were interested in STEM fields and uh, the university was investing more in STEM fields. Uh, I was undergraduate director in chemistry for 13 years. <clears throat> when I took over that job in 2003, uh, we were graduating a rolling average of about 18 chemistry majors a year. Uh, the last three years I did it, the rolling average was 62. So, tremendous growth in the number of people interested in STEM, and with that, the support that the university was putting into the STEM fields, sometimes to the dismay of the non-STEM fields, which is understandable. I I see both sides of that, but it's. Simply, uh, that's where the societal demand was, and uh, with that was also a very 
much enhanced focus on diversity and bringing uh, students from underrepresented groups who are underrepresented in science into science because there were very few uh, African Americans, Hispanics majoring in chemistry, almost, you know, uncountably small numbers uh, per year. Uh, and with the change in demographics in this country, to continue to fill the pipeline and demand for scientists at the industrial level, we need to uh, recruit, bring in, and support uh, more students from underrepresented groups. So that's been again a major emphasis of the last let's say 15 years. Uh, women as well, there, but we've always been close to 50 percent uh, female uh, in terms of numbers of chemistry majors. That's not been an issue, but by the time they move up the pipeline to the PhD and then to academics, the numbers really drop off. So you talked about growing the department. What were some other major challenges that you, you or the department faced while you're at UC? Uh, I think that one thing we always faced was budget. Um, I don't think I could recall a year from 1976 onward where we didn't have an annual budget cut at the college level. And of course, at the college level means passed down to the various departments. Um, <clears throat> when I came here in 1976, faculty, particularly in the sciences, are giving, given some sort of a startup package to buy some equipment and uh, so forth. I was given what in today's standards was a very small amount of money, I think it was $12,000, to get up and running and get research going. Uh, and about spring of my first year, I spent maybe 8000 8500 of that. My department head came and said, well, we're running out of money. Could you, could you give us the rest of it back? Uh, what do you say? Uh, so that was uh, that, my first experience with the budget cut. But every year through thereafter, and certainly I was uh, assistant head of the department for five years, and department head for 10 years thereafter, and every year there seemed to be a 1%, 2% budget cut. Now, since we've moved to performance-based budgeting, which presumably you've read about, we don't hear the word cut anymore. What we hear rather is that our threshold has gone up, how much we have to bring in. And it's the same thing, it's just in different language. But there's always been this challenge of enough money to uh, do what we want to do and what the university expects us to do. Uh, along with that, the idea of startup funds, uh, which isn't so relevant in the humanities, is very relevant. And nowadays, uh, startup packages are running 750,000 up to 900,000 to start. Yeah, <laughs> the numbers in that range, and where's that going to come from? Chemistry certainly doesn't have it. The university struggles to find it, so that has been a limitation to uh, our ability to hire uh, new faculty members. When I got here, we had about 27 tenure track faculty in chemistry. Um, we grew a little bit in the 80s, and I think our peak number was in 1991, we had 31 tenure track faculty. Uh, Two years ago, we were down to 18. And that gives you some idea. Uh, we knew that some of that was going to happen because we had this very strange demographic bubble uh, among our faculty with a cluster of senior faculty in, the six, in their 60s and early 70s and a cluster of young people and nothing in between. And now everyone in that upper cluster, save one, has retired. And uh, so we have a lot of hiring to do to rebuild but without access to startup funds, it's really hard to do. So that's, you know, that's one challenge that we've had as, as a constant challenge. Another, perhaps, is that recruiting graduate students, simply because uh, graduate students drive our research. We, as faculty, become managers 
whether we like it or not, that's what we are. And we are expected to come up with research ideas and research money, and then guide students to do the research and teach them how to do research so that they're prepared to do it when they graduate. Uh, that requires quality graduate students, and there's a huge competition nationally for good graduate students. And so we're always competing. Our stipends are always a bit lower than places up the road that we won't name and, and things of that sort. Uh, but that's another challenge we've faced, and we, you know, we face every year, and we do the best we can. So taking it on a more kind of um, like university-wide, you know, away from uh, the chemistry department, um, what have been some major changes that you have seen in you know the last four, 40 years, and did they happen fairly quickly, or was it kind of a slow and gradual change? You know, that could be demographic-wise. Yeah. That could be. Um, <clears throat> well. I think most of it is evolutionary, slow rather than uh, rapid. Um, obviously, one major change has been the physical plant. Um, when I came here, there were large asphalt uh, parking lots covering a fair bit of campus. Um, the campus green by Linder was one big uh, asphalt parking lot at that point. Uh, and the common joke was that UC stood for ugly campus. Uh, honestly, it was. Not only a lot of it was asphalt and crumbling uh, roads and buildings, but there was no uh, maintenance of, of landscaping and, you know, so in that sense, it was sort of an ugly campus. Then uh, President Steger, who took over in the early 80s, had a vision that uh, he was going to lead a tr transformation of the physical plant of campus, and uh, that happened over uh, probably a 15-year period, uh, which I've always joked, said that uh, UC stood for under construction. Uh, but now you see what we have today, what came out of that uh, extensive uh, process of tearing down, rebuilding, renovating, beautifying, it really is a very nice physical plant. The price of that is debt service, which is to say that you don't buy all these nice new buildings by uh, putting up the money up front and say, here, we want this building. You take out uh, debt, bonds, you float bonds to raise the money to uh, do the construction and renovation that you want. And then over a 20-year period, you have to pay those bonds back. So when Steger stepped down in about 2000, uh, Nancy Zimfer became president. Uh, and there was one more building on the drawing board at that point that was to be built within a couple of years. And that was a social science building for all the social sciences and arts and science. She came in, learned quickly about the budget and the extent of our debt service, and she canceled the building. And uh, to this day, uh, political science and sociology are still up in the tower, and psychology is over in Edwards, and, and, and so forth. So that building never happened because of uh, the debt service that uh, the university had incurred through that uh, phase. And then, in recent years, we've gone back to some construction, some over at the Med Center, and of course, the new build, business building that uh, will be very nice. And then, uh, where it goes from there, we will see. But since you may have seen the article back in the fall that Crosley Tower was rated one of the eight ugliest academic buildings in the country, uh, there is now a strong movement of foot to move everyone out of Crosley and to demolish Crosley. And so that's going to involve some combination of renovation, maybe construction, and so forth. And that planning process started the, intensively in the last couple of weeks. And we will see where it leads and how fast it leads us there. But that's certainly one global thing that's changed 
uh, around campus over the years. Definitely. And then, you know, in those, you know, 40 years, what do you think has been the most transformative period? You know, the, if you had a look at, you know, you mentioned the 80s, you know, obviously the early 2000s was a huge kind of change for the university as well. I, I you know, that's hard to say. I think one of the, <clears throat> I think the change in the physical plant uh, had a major impact on the institution. <clears throat> the change in presidents, first Simfer, briefly Williams, and then Ono, really had, you know, their vision of what the university was going to be, uh, I think had a major impact on uh, how we think about things. Uh, I think at the same time, the debt service that I uh, mentioned from all the construction has really held back because of resources the way that the faculty could evolve, grow, and at times be compensated. So uh, there was a price and trade out there. Uh, but I certainly think that construction period and, and the mess we went through for a long time uh, has transformed the campus and what people see when they come to campus. I think the other transformation that's happening that concerns me a great deal is uh, in the way that faculty, some faculty aspects are handled, which is to say that when I came and f probably through the 80s, we were 100% tenure track faculty. And that's the way it was. Uh, however, as these gentlemen know, there has been a growing number of educator faculty. Uh, that maybe started in the early 2000s. Faculty whose focus is on teaching only and who have no tenure and no opportunity for tenure. So they are contract, three-year contracts, maybe five if they've been here a while. So now we have a <clears throat> uh, poor uh, faculty, those who are tenure track and those who are educator, working together. And in the ideal circumstances, they do that pretty effectively. In some s environments, that doesn't go very well. Fortunately, in chemistry, it goes very well. And we've resisted hiring any more than we absolutely had to. But there's been a lot more and more pressure to hire educators particularly with the increased enrollments at the university at the price of, of tenure track faculty. Interesting. So you mentioned that the change in the physical plan of campus has like, obviously affected a great deal. How has this affected the area around the university? Uh, my kids would answer that better than I because they grew up knowing the old perimeter of campus and it was uh, very run down as well, you know, you know, anyone who's been here for some time, and you guys, are you from Cincinnati? Um, I spent the first five years of my life here. Okay. My parents lived here from the 80s and 90s, so they very much, when they think of UC, they think of the older. Yeah, but um, you probably don't remember much of that. No. But certainly, um, the Calhoun-McMillan area was totally different, run down, uh, uh, rundown buildings, empty dirt lots, uh, fair bit of crime. Uh, Stratford Heights didn't exist at that point. The housing area, it was um, all rundown as well. And it wasn't a place that uh, a lot of parents, particularly coming from suburban settings, wanted their students to go. So the idea of transformation was not only the campus, but enough of the perimeter to provide the environment for uh, parents who want to send their students there. And since the UC has, as I understand it, I'll, I'm not going to uh, know the details, uh, some of the debt service we've incurred has been in these perimeter areas, not just on campus itself. And uh, so they've contributed to that development. And obviously what we have on all sides of campus, well Burnett Woods is still Burnett Woods, but the other three sides of campus has greatly changed over the years. Definitely. And where have you lived while working at UC? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we lived in Westwood for the first year 
or actually the first 10 months that we were in Cincinnati, because we wanted to see what it was like and also to scout out neighborhoods where we might, might want to live. And that was the year 75, 76, 77, and the winter of 76 was infamous uh, for its cold, it's minus 26, minus 28 degree weather, and we were living in Westwood, our car wouldn't start, and uh, the buses weren't running, so we walked five miles to campus. We decided we were going to live close to campus. <laughs> so we really focused on Clifton, uh, up uh, north of Good Sam, uh, uh, near the Ludlow business area, and we kept our eyes open on for houses that came on the market, and there were several. Uh, another faculty member, colleague of mine, who came the same year, he and his wife bought uh, on the same street that we're on, ahead of us, and then told us about a house that was available uh, on Terrace that uh, was going on the market by owner, and uh, we might want to take a look at it. And that's the house we bought. So it's a little bit less than a mile from campus. And we are very happy to be close. And you've stayed there your... We've stayed there the close. entire time. Like you know, many old uh, brick houses, there was a lot of renovation and work to be done. Mm -hmm. And we've transformed the interior back, in some ways back to what it was, but in a modern way, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And we're very happy there and have no, no desire to, to uh, leave it. That's over by like Mount Storm Park. Well, not nearly there. that far up. Um, Terrace Avenue is the first east-west street north of Good Sam Hospital. Okay. Uh, where Brooker's Bagels is on mm -hmm. the corner. Right by the little yeah, so near Ludlow, and we're on Terrace. So okay. it's uh, south of Ludlow. It's not technically Gaslight District, mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, very convenient. We can walk to everything, and uh, uh, we've got good neighbors and a good neighborhood, so it's fine. That's awesome. I guess, you know, getting down to some of your time at UC and some of your memories, what have been some of the best things that you've worked on or some of the best memories that you have while, while here at UC? Uh, I think the thing I remember most probably is the support I've gotten from everyone around me. It's been a very friendly, collegial place, not only in the department, but the administrators, for the most part, that I've worked with, uh, it's been very supportive, and that's made doing what I do fun. And for the most part, I've had fun doing it. Uh, with research, uh, as I said, it's an expectation that we bring in money to support the work we do. That's not easy to do. Uh, success rates on funding are often in the 10 to 15 percent range. And a grant is usually good for three years, unless you're over at the Med Center. But for us, it's a three-year thing. So you go through a three-year cycle of uh, asking for more money and fighting that battle. And I, so one of the great excitements any time is getting another three-year grant, to, so you don't have to go through that for uh, you know three more years. But you know, other than that, you know. Uh, there have been highs and lows, but for the most part, it's been a really positive experience. Awesome. Which is why, as an emeritus, I'm still here hanging around doing things, because it's uh, still a place I love and want to support. Definitely. So what makes you optimistic, or what are some things that you see positively you know, going up for the future? Um, or you are for the university? Well, for the, yeah, you know, I think really of the university. Um, It's, it's, I think, really a question of can we maintain the momentum we have. We have grown, we've improved, we've uh, become much more national, if not international, in our scope. And that's been led by uh, two presidents, primarily, uh, Zimfer and then Ono. Williams was only here for a brief time, and I don't really want to comment on that. So really, to me, the question is uh, can uh, President Pinto maintain and grow that momentum. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Santa Ono announced that he was leaving, and I'd gotten to know him personally pretty well, I was disappointed and a little worried about where the university was going to be heading. 
And so then the search went on for a new president, and I learned, actually the night before it was being announced, who the new president was going to be, and I was very, very pleased, and that makes me optimistic. I've known Dr. Pinto since he was uh, an assistant professor in engineering, and I was somewhat more senior over here in chemistry. We interacted, and I've known him ever since, and so I was very enthused to see that he was chosen from among the, the names I had heard as candidates for that position. And then maybe, um, you know, what are some things that you look back at UC and even currently that you would, that you would change about the university? Um, I'm going to say something that's not politically popular and my colleagues to my left will probably disagree, but that's what we're here about. Uh, I think one of the things that I would change is the union. Uh, I know it's a, to me it's a mixed bag that uh, the union has many supporters, but I think it has done some good things, I am sure, but I also think in other ways it's a drag on the university and it's a drag on faculty who want to excel. In particular, I said it wouldn't be popular. Um, the, you know, the union rarely supports merit increases. Their interest is in raises that are essentially equal for everybody. And that doesn't, in my mind, uh, uh, really support excellence. It supports good people, for sure. But for people who really want to excel, uh, it's, it's a, you know, I sense it holds them back, and I know that our department has lost at least three very talented faculty members because of their frustration with that, and they've gone to universities, major universities, where that is not the case. So, um, would I totally change it, or would I do away with it, or whether I would just, if I rule the world, change it to much more of a merit-based system, that it's, it's hard to answer, but um, that's something that sort of worked in the background. Definitely. Yeah. And then, you know, for you um, personally, um, what are some things that you hope to achieve or do in the near future um, that can be personally or even professionally? Um, well, both, you know, a bit of both, but really what I'm doing now, as long as I'm able to, <coughs> Number one, my wife and I chose to retire at the same time before we were too old so we could travel. And we were talking about the pictures on the wall. There will be many more. Um, we're trying to aim for two international trips a year to places, you know, some we've been, but many that we've not been, uh, to see much more of the world and try to understand much more of the world. So the opportunity to travel and, you know, we always had it somewhat in the summer, but that's, for many places, that's not the best time to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the academic year was, you know, you had to be here doing research and teaching. So we are free to travel when we want to the places we want for as long as we want, except can't leave the dogs too long. Um, so that is one thing that we really look forward to, as well as travel within the U.S. We have a, a grandson up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and my son and his wife there, our daughter in Salt Lake City, uh, so we have places to travel within the United States. Um, the opportunity, we're leaving on Monday for eight days in Florida, just because we want to get away for a while and warm up. And that's something we couldn't have done before retirement. Um, but at the same time, when we're in town, I'm in here a bit of the day, seven days a week. Uh, this is my second home. I love research. Uh, the department is allowing me to maintain my research lab, at least for the visible future. And I'm in a position where I can go back to being the scientist I was trained to be, instead of the manager that I became. So I'm doing the research myself and I'm having a lot of fun with it. The other thing is that I have 40 plus years of institutional knowledge and experience. And as we change department heads and departmental leaders and 
sometimes college or university leaders, um, that, in, that institutional knowledge is needed. So I try to help where I can, uh, when I'm asked, and when I'm not asked, I stay out of the way. But, you know, we are right now, we have a brand new department head this year. There's a whole lot to learn, there's a lot going on, and uh, so I'm there to support him and to support others to the degree that they want me to. Yeah. So where, where, are, the, uh, where are the next two international trips? Um, in April, we are flying to Hong Kong and Taiwan, and in October, we are flying to Israel. Yeah, so those we we're excited about both of those for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So outside of travel, what are some other hobbies that you find yourself doing? <laughs> the university is that a hobby? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's always things to be done around the house. You know, I like yard work, gardening, uh, growing things. Can't do that much at this point, but uh, there's interior work in the house to be done, and uh, you know. Crossword puzzles and Sudoku and sports events to either attend or watch. You know, uh, part of what we enjoy about Cincinnati is uh, the playhouse in the park and live theater. So we subscribe to that. We subscribe. We have season tickets to the Bengals. So we have things to do uh, outside and with with friends and neighbors. But a lot of it's still focused on the university. I was going to ask that. Are you still committed to California teams, or are you a full local now? Um, we are Bengals fans. I'm still a Dodger fan. I say that quietly, but uh, we go to Reds games, and when they're not playing the Dodgers, I root for the Reds, but I'm still a Dodger uh, and Lakers fan at heart. Uh, but we have uh, adopted the Bengals. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Yeah. It, you know. There are good years and bad years. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if, is there anything else that maybe we haven't touched on that you would, uh, I don't know, like to No, I discuss? think the, you know, uh, I've always felt it's been a great experience. I uh, were, was amazed sometimes that they paid me to do it because I was having fun. And although it's not the salary level that one would make in industry, uh, the experience has been much more fun than I think working in industry would be and the uncertainties and being told what they want you to do. So uh, I have no complaints, regrets whatsoever. Perfect. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's all of our questions, too. Do you know or? Okay, actually, we should probably, for the record, um, off camera are myself, uh, Fritz Casey Lanier from the History Department, and this is Gino Passi from the uh, uh, faculty librarian. Okay. Um, I always enjoy sitting in on these, learning about my colleagues. Um, I can imagine they would be very interesting. Yeah, it's all, it's all, the ones I've sat in are always lots of fun. Good, good. So, I very much enjoyed listening to, to your story. Well, it's, it's Thank you. been a great time. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Thank you.